Welcome to Raging Bullets, a DC Comics fan podcast. Episode 198, Alpha. I'm Sean Whelan, Dr. Norge on the Comic Forums. This episode I'm joined by very special guest in front of the show, David Barron, colorist of DC Comics. David is joining us to talk about Detective Comics number 826. We talked a lot about the internet community and the positive internet community that's been formed about comics. It's really great to have this enthusiastic discussion with David. It's also... We're introducing a brand new contest, which David is a co-sponsor of. He actually is donating an incredible prize and came up with a wonderful contest idea that I think you guys are all going to really enjoy. The contest is going to be culminating on March 23rd, which is actually the anniversary date of the show. It's the four-year anniversary of uh, Raging Bullets. It's actually the reason for our crazy numbering scheme right now. We're kind of delaying the numbering of quote-unquote episode 200 for that week because that's going to be our anniversary week and we'd like to have that uh, it's kind of cool to have episode 200 for that so that's the reason why we've got these we're going to be going back to single episode numbering after that but yeah, we kind of want to have our 200th episode right tied in with that four year anniversary so I want to thank David for joining us our sponsors for this episode are instocktrades.com and dcbservice.com dcbservice.com is your pre-order comic source there's some incredible deals over at dcbservice.com go and check them out instocktrades.com they sponsor our rage of the months friend of the show kent Hare and jim uh, jim's been sick this week kent Hare's had some family issues and i just wanted to give kent a shout out and just say man our hearts with you guys uh, JLA Avengers is slightly delayed for the next couple episodes. We are going to be getting that in. We're also going to be getting Preacher in before we hit 200. So the next couple weeks we're going to be getting both of those things and wrapping them up. Because I have a huge plan of something that to me is one of my favorite greatest DC stories of all time. I've wanted to do this on the show since we've been started. It's a Batman story. It's something very classic that is one of my personal favorites. It was out of print during part of the time that our show has been in place. So just some kind of little clues. This is going to be the next In Stock Trades Rage of the Month. I want to get the other two done before we hit 200 first. Then I want to announce that by 200. Very cool story, one that I'm dying to do, which fits our whole theme of episode 200, that we are going to be doing greatest DC stories of all time as we see them. So it's going to be kind of fun, and we want your participation in that. So remember to call our show voicemail line, 1440-388-4434, 1440-388-4434, or Dr. Norge on Skype. Love to have you guys be a part of that. I want to thank InStockTrades.com for continuing to support those books of the month. We really, really appreciate it. We are proud members of the Comics Podcast Network and the League of Comic Book Podcasts, and you can hear us on Get Your Geek On Radio, GetYourGeekOnRadio.com, making geek chic. And there's a link on RagingBullets.com to click right on there and to listen to our show right from there. What kind of a podcast are we, pal? Well, Sean, we are a spoiler podcast. We go in-depth in the plot lines, story twists, and whatnot of the comics we're reviewing on the show. So if we're going over something you haven't read, you may want to come back later so you can better enjoy the show. Spinning with great speed, the Flash creates a protective vacuum around himself. Joining me right now is friend of the show and colorist, David Barron. And David, welcome back to Raging Bullets. It's great to have you on. Thank you very much. I'm glad to uh, be back on the show. We've been doing a number of contests with you. Uh, you. This is the third one now that we're going to be introducing. I love the fact that you've got this blog going now, uh, myzombies.blogspot.com, and you've uh, linked it in with your Twitter, which is twitter.com forward slash myzombies, both of which are linked on our website. What drove you as a colorist, as an artist, to start blogging again? Because I love your blog really covers so much of you. It's not just your comic work. It's art that you're doing on your own. We're getting to know you, too, from your blog, which I really like. It's, it's a very interactive site, and the videos, to me, is, I think, a very cool addition. Well, you know, I, when Blogger first started and, and, you know, MySpace and all that, I was, I was very active in that. And I used to blog daily. I blog about comics, about, about my life. Uh, I was, I think, you know, 21, 22 at the time. If I went to a party, I would post, you know, 
picks about that and, and just kind of give a recap of my everyday life in comics. It was hard to tell how many people were actually interested. It was hard to tell how many people really cared. And I'd get comments, you know, randomly here and there. Uh, with modern, you know, technology, I'm able to track that. So it's a little bit more of an inspiration for me to keep doing that. Um, you know, I, I range from about 200 hits a day on my blog, so I'm able to keep blogging. But, you know, I just, I guess I do it for um, the interaction with the fan, the interaction of, of people who like art of different types. What I do in comics is still relatively new to a lot of people. So the videos that I post are just kind of, you know, so you kind of see the process of, of coloring comics, especially with um, all the different artists that I work with, from Jacques to uh, Doug. It's it's a different process. It's a, you know, different, uh, interesting uh, mindset. And I think the blog is a good way to, to show that, to, to show the uh, creativity on, on my end. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, people enjoy that. That's one of the things that I enjoy. Being, I'm a comic fan, but I'm not an artist. I don't have an art training. For me, it's always been about enjoying the work that all of you put together. In recent years, one of the great things about the Internet has been with all of you guys reaching out and kind of letting us into your world, it's made my appreciation of what goes into putting out just a monthly book, the amount of work on each level to put that monthly book out and to get it out to us on time and for us to be able to read these books, my appreciations just are through the roof. I was already there geeking out about all this, but that has been something for me. It's it's taken my respect level of this even up, which I never thought was possible, up another notch. So I, I applaud you and other creators who've been doing this because I do think it's a great way for us to just get a little insight more into this wonderful medium and that there's so many stages involved in this process of putting out this thing that we enjoy. It, it is. And, you know, we talked before about a positive environment, and the one reason I like Blogger and Twitter is that it's it's pretty positive and it's you're, you can't hide behind a name even though you know I go through my zombies everybody knows it's me and anytime I make a comment it, it shows who that comments by and uh, you can you know directly correspond with that person you get to choose to follow um, or unfollow people you know at will I'm sure all of us that have been on Twitter have followed people before and then said I'm not really interested anymore in what this person says or Maybe they say too much, and it you know blogs down the page. But uh, it's a positive environment where we get to interact. It's fun for me to see the passion that you have, the passion that other people have. I follow some fans, mostly professionals, just because I'm a fan as well. And it, it brings back the enjoyment of comics, and that's a part of the blogging and uh, the Twitter following that I enjoy. I was against Twitter for a while, but I thought if I'm going to start the blog and start traveling you know, to conventions again, I should see what it's all about, and, and I'm enjoying it. I'm glad I'm on there. I follow so many comic creators now. It's great for me with comic creators to see... Like you posted Choker, for example, on mm -hmm. on your blog as a book that you were recommending, for, and and it's funny. I'm, I've got a PSP Go, and they've mm -hmm. been releasing a lot of IDW's digital comics. I've never, I'll be honest with you, I haven't looked at or read anything yet with Ben Temple Smith. Your posting that drove me to. I immediately downloaded some of his Wormwood stuff from IDW onto Which my PSP Go. Yeah, it is. It's it's great. Yeah. Fantastic. But I get into that because I already. Obviously, there's something about your sensibilities in creating comics that I'm connecting with because I really enjoy your work. So to see you recommend something, I'm like, okay, there's a commonality here. I'm not an artist, but I know by the way you deliver your work that you understand what I'm looking for in an emotional delivery of a comic book story. So I'm like, if you're digging this, I'm going to. And sure <laughs> enough, you know, I, I ended up, uh, I ordered Choker. I'm waiting for that to come this week. I ordered it through the mail to come in. I really dug his Wormwood stuff, so you turned me on to something new. That's what I'm loving about, like, Twitter and blogs and things like that, is getting just interaction with people who I have common interests with or common ideologies with and things like that, and I'm getting exposed to new things that are making me geek out on a very cool level. So thanks for the recommendation. Temple Smith's 
um, amazing. The only thing better than his art is, is him in person. He's a fantastic person. The writer, uh, Ben McCool, another fantastic person. Two people that I hope to see uh, a lot in Emerald City this weekend. And uh, it, it's true, you know, Twitter is just, just a, com- you know, I, always, I tell people, I go, you know, it's really funny how big of an entertainment community Twitter really is. You don't really go to Twitter to really chat with your friends. You go to Twitter to chat with other people that you don't really know. You have a, what's that, chat roulette, you know, web, webcam type of thing that you hear about on the news uh-huh. and how that's just random people that you don't really care about. It's just kind of for a freak show where Twitter right now for the comic community is really quite the community. It's actually something that is used the way it's supposed to be used. You, you get to interact and talk with several different creators. All the creators that I know respond back to messages to them. So if you mention them in a uh, tweet, 99% of them will message back. It's a nice community of, of comic creators and comic fans coming together in, again, a positive environment. And I think one of the great things about just the interactivity with comics now, I find that I reread my comics. Like before, when we started doing the show, I was rereading my comics multiple times just to kind of get my head around the art and things like that. Now I find that I'm going back yet again because of things I'll read in a Twitter comment or something like that, you know, something that somebody else right. caught. And to me, you know, people talk about the price of comics and things like that nowadays. To me, the value now of comics with all of this interactivity has just, like, skyrocketed because I find that I'm looking at the books more, I'm reading them more, I'm spending more time looking at panels, because there is discussion topics coming out of this. Different people are talking and chatting about them, blogging about them, twittering about them. This, to me, is... Fa- and, and then creators will chat about something that they saw or found interesting, and that gets me to look back at it again. It's, you know, fans, creators, all of that. This is nowadays where the price point of the comics that all of a sudden looked like it was so huge... It shrinks really quick. Last time we talked, we, we talked about disappearance of the letter column. Mm-hmm. And I think Twitter's almost replacing the letter column with an interactive letter column, where if you find the writer or the artist, there's your letter column right there. If you find the editor, I know several editors from Marvel and DC that are on Twitter. And it's, it's your own personal gateway to, to the editor or the artist. I think that's another reason why I'm happy to see the community of comics on Twitter being strong, because it does replace that letter column that, that we all missed. Absolutely. And that is something I grew up, I always read the letter column. I got to admit, I never sent in many letters, but I liked reading them because usually the people in letter columns were asking the questions I wanted to ask anyway, which is why I guess I never was driven to send in many letters. I sent out a couple, but... I always loved seeing either the editor or the creator's responses to, because sometimes it would be the writer, sometimes it would be the editor, sometimes it would be the artist. Sometimes it rotated, other times it was always the same person. But to me, we always got questions answered that we had beyond the pages, and it was our gateway into something more, another value. And then I would go back and reread the issue again based on something I read in the letter column. Or maybe go back two or three issues and reread them again because it was about a previous issue. And that's cool. Yes, that, that is very cool. And, and I'm really uh, excited about the blogging and, and tweeting just, just for that factor, just the, the extra layer into the comic book that you guys are reading. I don't really consider myself a huge insight, but any insight that I can give of, of the work that I do... I, I enjoy. That, that's a good, positive thing. I like your original work, too. You're doing a lot of original, you're throwing up a lot of original work and things that you're doing. You did an album cover that recently that was up there that I saw that was like, wow, that's really cool. And you talked through the process of it. And I love, you made it seem so simple the way you were talking about it. I'm sitting here, I'm like, I could never do that in a million years, but it's gorgeous. <laughs> so I really, but I mean, that's something to me, I think a strength of your blog has been just the amount of originality from you. I'm getting something from you that I wouldn't see anywhere else. Right. You know, you always worry about spoiler alerts on, on comic books and how much do we really want to show before the book comes out. We work so far in advance sometimes, not always, where you're really excited about something and you want, you want to tell people about it, but you can't. So I think uh, original artwork is something that keeps their creative process going. And you can only draw Superman so many times before you need to draw something else. Color artists a lot of times try to break in through writing or through penciling, and they were asked, well, why don't you try color? because there's the opening for that. 
And so I know I know a lot of uh, colorists that have great original art. Friend of the show, Alan Paslaqua, he does great vector art out of San Francisco. Um, just just amazing stuff. There's a lot of other computer colorists that that have their own original artwork, blogs and and galleries that that are pretty amazing. It's a just a great way to share you know other stuff that we do. Just again more more interaction and more openness of our at least our creative lifestyle to the world. You mentioned the Emerald City Comic Con. I want to make sure we go to this. You're going to be at the Emerald City Comic Con this coming weekend, and you have a table now, correct? Yes, they, they were kind enough to give me a booth uh, in Artist Alley. So I will be, I believe it's IO6, and uh, that will be my booth number. On, if you have a sketchbook, I'll do a free Green Lantern or Green Arrow sketch, or maybe anything else, depending on time and created some postcards with my original artwork on there that will will eventually be available on the blog, but right now I want to give them to the con goers first. A couple other different things for sale, and as always, if you mention the podcast, you'll you'll get a killer deal because, again, we, we're, I'm in it more for the, the fans than I am for the money, so make sure if you come by and see me at Emerald City that you definitely say that you heard this on the podcast and the show and or the Twitter and blog. It was a good thing, and it'd be great to chat with anybody that wants to come out and see me. It's something I want to give as a, from a fan standpoint, a shout-out to creators in general, just how friendly creators are at cons. I love going to cons. You stop down Artist Alley, and just to chat with people. Every, you know, everyone's so friendly, wants to talk, wants to talk comics. Not just comics, media in general. and It's just such a fun atmosphere. Con, a, going to a convention, if you're considering going to the Emerald City Comic Con, just going to a convention in general is just such a great event for me. I look forward to it because it really, there's a community aspect to comics now, I think, that is just so refreshing because I used to, growing up, it felt like such an isolated hobby. And now it really is, you can't go anywhere and not find comic fans right. now, which is great. <laughs> I think it's just fantastic. No, it, it, you know, Emerald City is put on by just a great group of people. I've been there a couple times throughout the past when the show was smaller and, and just because how good of a group of people they are, the show has just exploded into a fantastic Comic-Con. I, I can't wait to go. The talent that's going to be there, the guest list is amazing. The fans that go there are some of the nicest fans to be around. And as you said, you know, come by and say hi. I, I, the Part of the reason we show up, you know, not only to sell artwork and things like that, but it is to interact with the fan. It, quite honestly, it would be pretty boring if no one talked to us. <laughs> we just sat there all day. We, we do like to talk to fans, and especially ones that appreciate our work and, and even the ones that just appreciate the company that we work for. If you're a DC Comics fan, it's always a, a nice person to meet and to say hi to. I want to talk real quick, if we could, about your recent work with Jock on Detective Comics. I read again last night Detective Comics number 862. Basically, it's Batman and Batwoman together. What amazes me is, I've seen you, your work so recently on Batman Confidential, it's amazing that every art team that you work with even though you're working with the same character universe, your color choices, your tones, and the mood and atmosphere of it, it always feels very Batman, yet it completely changes to match the story and the creative team. This is very different than recent work that I've seen, for example, in Batman Confidential. I love that because it's my respect level, and I've shared this with you before on the show, for colorists and what you guys bring to the table has so gone through the roof, my understanding of it has so gone through the roof. This work, it's, it starts off on the opening page where we see a, a very traditionally colored, you see his hands looking over at Vanessa Gray missing and the reward mm -hmm. for the information. But then we get into these great color choices where we're using very solid, what seemingly very solid colors with different shading and atmosphere to set a mood and a tone. And I love what's going on here because we've got the family with these yellow tones trying to come to an understanding. And I love that we see like Gordon's coat like in like a more of a natural color through there mm -hmm. so it kind of stands out as a colorist how does with this being like a work that you're doing with Jacques now how is it different to do that than something you've done previously in Batman Confidential where do these color choices come from this reminded me a lot of what I really enjoyed of the work you were doing in Vigilante for example and my kind of my head kind of went right back there. I'm like, ooh, this is you know, this is what I like about David. When we get down to this kind of gritty film style, because this felt like a film to me. Yeah, you know, to to me, 
Again, with uh, I think I mentioned this before, I try to match a different style with every artist I work on. Mm-hmm. Obviously, there are some similarities because it is me working on them, so there's some consistency in there. With Detective, I want it to be a crime story. I want it to be dark, and I want it to be Batman. It's the Batman universe, again, that I, I hold closest to my heart. A fantastic writer, fantastic artist. My job is easier because of those guys. Now, what, what, what we try to do is we try to, again, tell story number one with the whole past present thing I try to separate the color schemes I want to keep the color schemes you know relatively consistent throughout the whole story uh, not just per issue but per story and I want to stylize I want you to see the page and to know that's where this page came from that this page is from Detective Comics and not from Green Arrow year one you know another book I did with Jacques I want to convey the mood I want I want it dark I want it dingy I want it frightening even and I think the I think the biggest thing that I tried to do on this book was again still complement the beauty in the art, the simplicity in the art that that is complex. It's a lot harder sometimes to draw something without backgrounds than it is with the background because there's so much more attention that will be given by the reader to the character. Where sometimes, as we talked about, if you put just a bunch of stuff all over the page, your eye doesn't really go anywhere; it just goes everywhere. Where in detective, every little piece is pinpointed for the reader where we want you to look at so if if the detail is is in the hand we're really showing you the hand and in that i think the story really comes alive it it is a crime story it is a detective story and with the two different uh, past and presents between Batman and Batwoman, I think my job was just to make sure that was clear. The complexity of the book is that we don't want to spell out every little detail, but we definitely want to make sure that it's still clear what, what's going on, and I think we pulled that off. I think, I think it looks fantastic, and I think that was my biggest role of, of the book is to understand what the writer and artist were going for and to uh, finish out their idea. Early on in the book, there was like the interrogation where they were talking to Trent, the security guard. You were talking about focusing on a specific body part or specific something for to convey an emotion. On the next page of that, I was I was just thinking of that moment. He's having trouble because he's working three jobs. Found out his daughter has cancer, and and I love that it's a. You're talking about we don't want to reveal everything. It's a mystery that's unfolding through Batman's eyes during this part, where we start to realize, hey, wait a minute, this guy is not telling the whole story because he's trying to cover for himself. He doesn't want to lose his job. He's working three jobs because he has to. Batman's discovered this and he's just saying, tell me the whole story. I can cover here. But the look on his face, first of all, we've got this, the eyes just burst open wide and we've got these wonderful green tones in this moment. And then you see his eyes go shut as Batman's just telling him, but another father's child is in danger. I can save her. And I love how the dialogue and the, the picture tone and everything in his eyes match the emotion of that moment and it is something you're right there is no background there there doesn't need to be it's not about the background it's about focusing on the crinkle in his forehead it's about focusing on his face it's about focusing on the the emotion that's being brought about and the colors at that moment i felt for him at that because i'm like oh my because we've all been busted at something (laughs) right we've all been there before we go through that shock and i totally related to that i've never had this type of situation but i've related to to that feeling, that raw emotion of being in that moment. And that was something that, when you talked about the focus on that, I just totally ate that up. This is exactly what was conveyed in the pages. And I think that's what's really making this this run of Detective top-notch. I think I think this run is, is solid, and I think it's the little details that have been put forth in the story from start to finish. And really hope that people are picking it up and, and enjoying the hard work that's being put into it. How do you prepare for working with Jock after doing, like, I'm thinking back to Batman Confidential, you did the Black Hawk story, which I, th- mm-hmm. I thought that was great. I'm a big fan of the Black Hawks. And it was a very different style story than this. And yet, both of them, very Batman. Right. As, as we always talk about, there is a business side to comics. And with Black Hawk, when that run came to be, it was, the artwork was in on time, and it was beautiful, but it collided with other deadlines, which is, you know, sometimes just the nature of the beast. 
And we definitely had to think of a style. And when I say we, uh, I rem- me is in coloring, but Mike Carlin, the editor, or Mike uh, Singlain, the editor, or Mike Marks, the editor. Again, the process is, is bigger than just one person. We wanted to make sure that there was a style to it that that was consistent, that was representing the artwork. There was so much grayscale, so much ink wash in the pages itself that my job was really, again, just to complement the work that was already done by the penciler. And I think the color schemes were a little bit brighter and, and a little bit not as, as dingy because we were dealing with a different villain. We're, we're dealing with a different character where the Blackhawks are definitely different than Cutter. Cutter and Detective is a much deeper, crazier character. And and again, I, I just want to convey emotion. I think most of my artwork, no matter what it is, whether it's my personal artwork or it's comic book artwork, I am a big fan of emotion. If we don't have emotion into the piece, then it's not really art to me. It's just, I don't know, it's just you know, pencil on paper, I guess. As long as the, the reader is feeling some type of emotion, getting into the story, stepping away from their life and following either the side character's life or the main characters or even the villain, you know, relating some bits of their life to theirs in the story, then I think a book is successful. I think if the comic book or any other book misses that mark where there is no relation to the reader and the character, then the book definitely will fail. I'm a huge Batman fan, so usually before I'm, I'm a Batman guy, I'm like, I'm, yes, I'm totally getting that vibe because you understand it. I love when you were making comments about how I, I need, you know, I'm paying attention to what's going on in the story. I'm paying attention to the characters that are in the story. I'm paying attention to the mood that's been set by the pencils and all that, trying to accentuate that in ways that make sense for that book so that it, it keeps that flow going. And that's really important because you're talking about, right, and I, the reason why I deliberately brought up that story because it is so drastically different than this both great Batman stories, very different Batman stories in their presentation, and rightfully so, as they should, because the art style is very different in both books. I love that about comics, and I should something I applaud about your work on both of these has been the fact that I can read two different works that you have been involved with. I can take a look at the color structure and what you were doing, and as a fan, appreciate the fact that, wow, he really did something different on this one because this is what matched what was being done over here. But then we see over here, I'm looking at the reds right now, now with Batwoman on the cycle, with the villain, the high-intensity danger of those reds in those moments, I'm like, ugh, it's something I want to see. I'd love to see this animated, particular cycle sequence, because I'm like, ooh, would that look good on an anime screen or what? Yeah, Yeah, I agree. You know, every time I try to do something, the, the pieces that really bring enjoyment to me personally are the ones that I can see moving the ones I can see just in action. I think every true comic book fan, when they read the comic books, the panels come to life. They don't stay stagnant. They're not just something on printed on a paper. It's something that we're imagining moving. We're imagining talking. We're imagining if, uh, Batman's punching someone. We actually see the punch and feel the punch. I think that's kind of the job of the artist is to convey that motion. And uh, so we can actually see it in our mind as, as movement. And that adds again to the story. One of the things I really liked, and I, I don't know what drove your choices on this, but it was really good. In that sequence I was just talking about, the motorcycles, I love that we see the police vehicle where we see the blues kind of like framing the danger of the red outside. They're looking at what we are. Mm -hmm. It was a separation from the action that was going on outside. I love the use of reds all the way through and I loved how you framed it. You even did it with the van at the um, the last panel, the last page of uh, this sequence where we see the red of the danger outside and Batwoman comes into color, a different color tone and we see the villain in a different color tone inside the van. Don't know what led to you doing those choices but I loved the framing of effect of the whole thing because to me it added this sense of the danger outside and you know her coming out of what she was in the middle of with that high intense action out there into finally getting the villain and and to seeing the police witness it to me it felt like they were framing like i was sitting in the car with them at that moment right. and the color choices i thought were really great that you did there because that to me felt like i was a part of that particular sequence i, I would say what you just pointed out what is one of the main things that i do that other people don't on a consistent basis it's kind of my way of of how you said framing the action to the non-action framing the focus of the viewer it's you know 10 years ago i probably would have blurred the cops 
And so it was more cinematic where one's out of focus, one's in focus. And then, I, you know, I was thinking, how else can I do this? That doesn't alter the artwork. And I figure, well, let's, let's just do extreme color changes, complementary color cho- changes, but let's, you know, do extreme color changes for depth and for distinction. Sometimes, sometimes it's to, to pull it way forward. Sometimes it's just to calm down the information. But the, my biggest goal is just so we don't have have artwork blurred that you get to see exactly what's on the page a lot of my time at wildstorm effects with heavy heavy superhero books we blurred so many things and i thought it was appropriate appropriate for that time and for that artwork. But for this book, Detective, and uh, some of my other books that I work on, you know, blowing the artwork isn't necessarily appropriate. It just becomes a filter effect that uh, isn't really necessary. I'm not a big fan of, of eye candy coloring where you're doing things just because you know that people be like, oh, you know, that, that smoke's blurred. It looks so soft and that's so awesome. But if there's beauty in the line work by the artist, I'd rather complement that with the color and leave the line work alone. So the reader can really appreciate all the work that the artist puts through. Now, if the artist intended all the line work to be blurred, they probably would draw it a little bit different and we'd have that interaction as, as a colorist artist and we'd communicate that and, and we would, then I would blur it because it was kind of meant for that reason. So again, it's, it's, it's really what favors the book, what favors the artist and what's really going to give the emotion. And then as you mentioned with the cops, you know, the cops are just sitting there watching for the most part away. They're, they're in action, they're pursuing, but they're not in danger necessarily What's in danger is the armor car and, and, the, and the motorbike that is really being shot at and being pursued. So it's, it's the, definitely just the distinction and framing of, of the artwork. And, and I do enjoy that. And I think if you follow my work, you'll see that more often than not. That panel in particular is one, though, where I felt like I was in the backseat of the car. I felt like I was like in an episode of Cops. And I was sitting right. in the back seat, like, yeah, and I'm I like, agree. that's cool. <laughs> I'm like, that was, it was really a cool, tr- and it really is something where the colors did that, because if you hadn't have made that framing choice, if you had done the whole panel red, or, or even a, a color tone that was closer to the red, right, that would have been lost for me. And that was something where, because of the fact that the bold was, the blue was uh, so boldly different, it had that effect of pulling me into that frame and it, it was one that i wanted to note because it did have an effect for me that pulled me into the book i geek out at and, those moments and that's what that was intended for i mean that was to separate and in such a crowded double page spread you don't want to lose the subtlety of the depth that the artist created you we don't want to lose that jock did this fantastic foreground so you can look between two cops head as if you were in the back seat and if it was just all red or just all normal you may not have that full feeling but to, to keep the mood of the book and the, the story going but still give you what was intended I chose to do that and, and i'm glad it, it seemed to work <laughs> it seemed like you you got exactly what we were hoping for batman and batwoman's stories uh, start to converge here because we've got uh, batman is doing his interrogation here and here's a bit where the the colors really just it was important in these two pages here with Batwoman and Batman both in these knife fights to keep the action moving and yet make sure that it doesn't get confusing. And that's a hard thing to do because this is supposed to be very intense. High action, keep moving, run Lola run type of thing where it's just gonna, this story does not stop. And if, if you make the wrong choices here, you can stop somebody at the panel where they're like, okay, who's in this panel and what are they doing? I never felt that. That was one of the great things about the color tones that were established. You had by this time established a set of a color palette for these fight sequences in the previous pages. And I'm like, okay, we're right in with Batwoman. And then we're jumping with Batman. And this fight is just ba-bam, ba-bam, ba-bam with the two of them mirroring each other. And I really loved the tone and the placement of this because it was so much following these two winding up basically in the same dire situation where they both are pretty battered from the experience they were in. To me, connecting Batwoman on some level with Batman is something I've been enjoying slowly following through this whole run of Detective Comics. And to see it here just come together in such a way where you can see what these two have in common. Because on the surface, both characters, internally both characters, are different. But yet there is a common experience in their drive 
and their intensity and their motivations to try and bring about justice and to try and stop a crime or and to try and rescue somebody. And that was the great thing about this moment because it took two characters that seem very different and made me sh- see in that moment exactly what makes them so alike, that they won't stop in those fights. Right. It was just an intensity that never got lost because of the choices of, of how these panels were colored. There was a constant flow. Well, that's, that's a great compliment. <laughs> and, I, and I, again, it's one of those things that that's what we strive for as a combo colorist, as an artist, is just where we're not taking away, we're adding to the reader's experience. And it's just really nice to hear that some of that work definitely paid off to what our goal was, to, to the intended feel. And I think Detective uh, on this run is, is one of those books that from start to finish, I think the reader gets that, and I think they definitely get their money's worth. Was it hard to choose the different palettes for Bruce, or for, uh, well, I guess I'm guessing Bruce, because that's one of the things that's interesting about this run is, where does Batwoman fall in relation to current continuity? But in this particular moment, was it hard for Batman to decide his palette versus Batwoman's in, the, in that sequence to make sure to keep that flow? Because it worked. Yeah, well, for me, you know, this, this is actually what I did, is I said, I'm going to do Batwoman as I do Batman, and I'm going to do Batman as I do Nightwing. And ah. it's, I know it's kind of a, it's not necessarily an old school process, but I just wanted to give the main, my, my main Batman feel that I love doing to Batwoman. And everything I did for Batwoman, I wanted it to be more danger. And everything I did for Batman, I wanted it to be a little bit more um, grimy, a little bit more calm, I guess. The calm part played into more of the blues and the greens. So you had a different feel with Batman because we know Batman very well. We know his character. We know his too much of his personal life, too much of his professional life. And I think we have a, a more understanding of them that, that really calms us down a little bit, that we trust Batman. We, we trust Batman's success. And right now, we don't trust Batwoman's success. We don't know about her success. We don't know about her. And we're, we're really developing. We're starting to follow her life more and more. And the, and the more people read a, a Batwoman main character book, the more we get to know her. And I wanted to keep that danger and suspense alive with her. And so everything that involves her, I try to make more dangerous. And because I'm, you know, it's a, it's a new character for us all. And even even myself, I'm, you know, just like you guys where I get to read the script. And that script is relatively new to me. So it's something that I'm developing and, and I'm trying as a colorist to find a sense of character as well. Where I'm trying to get to know that woman like everybody else is. You know, there are, there are no editorial meetings with me involved that say, you know, we want that woman to have this feel. So really, if the feeling I get is from the the writer through the script and through the artist when they deliver pages to me and then I kind of go from there I, I process the information then I just hope that I that what I do they like and uh, so far so good it's funny when you were talking about too as you're talking about we know so much of his personal life that the focus of the danger and the the uncertainty with her needs to be focused on her in this particular sequence of events but I like that it's framed with the established hero but you're talking about we jumped after this right into her cousin Betty Kane, which to me, I'm an old school Batman fan. I I knew about the original Batwoman and Betty Kane. I was curious to see how this cousin Betty Kane, is she the same one that we've seen in the recent past or not? And that's something for me as a fan, I want to know her personal life. And I want that focus to be there. So your choices, as far as thinking about that emotionally, where this is going to be going, it's spot on because we do go to this moment where we see that she was, in fact, the flame bird that we knew recently who was in there. And that reveal was like, whoa, (laughs) you know, and that she's determining can i let that past go is that obviously that past is still very much a part of her if she's got that laid out on the floor you know? yeah. <laughs> and, and how cool is that moment where we're kind of like whoa this it, to me it's a big reveal that we now know a little bit more of her past history 
And that's a cool thing about that sequence. There's so much going into it, and, and I read somewhere that people wish that Detective would just be a Batwoman title right now, that everything is going so well with Batwoman as the lead in Detective. Maybe it should be Detective with Batwoman as a star, more so than not, you know, at least continue, because everybody's really fallen in love with this character and her life. I, I always say that you base any character around Batman, and you're going to have a successful character, but that's that doesn't make it true in mainstream comics because mainstream comics has to have a higher fan base. So the character might be successful, but it may not be able to hold such a powerful title as, as high as it needs to. But Batwoman re- is really doing it. I think uh, the depth that they're putting into the character is fantastic. And, and it's, as you know, you know, I don't read every single DC book, you know, but this is a, uh, one that I definitely looked for back issues to find out more about her. I mean, I, I liked her when I was, you know, coloring her in 52. And it was just, you know, this, this beginning type of idea. And what I'm working on now is, to me, a breath of fresh air. I love the book I'm working on. Whenever you can love, you know, what you're working on, it no longer becomes work. And it just, it just becomes an enjoyment. And with uh, Batwoman as the lead character, it's, it's pure enjoyment. I'm thrilled she's getting her own series because I think every appearance from her, every issue with her, I've, I've loved her since her first appearance of 52, too. You, I, I'm totally in sync with you on that. She's been a character that's, I think, gotten only more interesting the more we've learned about her. Definitely. And Definitely. more captivating. I'm part of the camp that says I would have loved to have seen her stay in Detective. That's not. I'm not knocking the fact that she's getting her own series. I'm thrilled. I'm, I, I want her somewhere. Oh, I'm thrilled. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I'm thrilled yeah. she's getting her own book. Because but, out of all the people that get their own book, mm-hmm. uh, she's definitely well-deserving. I think it's a character, though. I'm, I'm a Batman mark. That's my character. I love Batman. For me to say that I would like somebody else to be the star of Detective Comics, that's a compliment to the character and to the creative teams that have worked on this character. Because to me, uh, you know, reading this issue, I I have no doubt in my mind. I'm like, uh, why not? Just keep it. It's working. (laughs) Yeah, no, I I fully agree. You know, I'm I'm always a skeptic when uh, people touch Batman in any way. I don't, you know, I I love my classic, hardcore Batman that that plays by certain certain rules and never bends from those rules. I could take as many Batman stories as possible. It doesn't mean I enjoy them all, but I definitely enjoy the fact that they keep coming out. When that woman took over the title, I was like, uh. but honestly, this, this has been such an amazing run by everybody that's been on this uh, book that I'm happy that, that she's on it. I think it's some of the best detective uh, storylines in years. And, uh, and that's not knocking all the other great ones that, that have gone on recently. It's just Batwoman is, is, you can tell it's here to stay in the DCU to be a, be a big part. It's this run of Detective Comics in general, all the way through. One of the things that it reminds me so much of, one of my favorite Batman series, especially in the first few years of it, was Legends of the Dark Knight. Mm-hmm. Just very cutting edge with uh, the types of stories it was doing. They, they were just premier arc teams, premier... Every arc was showing that Batman's a character who, yeah, you think you know everything about the types of stories you can do with Batman, and every arc showed us that you can take the Batman type of story and do some different things with it. Batwoman's doing that. This is a great example of this is very different artwork from the last arc, yet that's what I'm loving about it. It's it's showing that this character is more than a one-trick pony. This character can go into a... uh, This is a very deep gritty detective story which fits the theme of detective comics this is what i want from this type of book it's edgy and i I like i like an edgy book this one went from this is one of the first books i pick up on that week when it comes out and i will pick this up over other batman stories (laughs) a lot of times because of the fact that i'm like it's so cool yeah i I mean i I agree it's it's from start to finish from the covers to you know the very last page you're you're getting quality and and it's definitely worth the price and and i'm glad you're enjoying it and i'm you know happy to to hear that so many people are enjoying the book and it's it's again it's a pleasure to work on and i I don't want it to end (laughs) for me but you know as uh, my part my part uh on detectives coming to an end but it was it was a great part of of my comic book uh, resume and i'm really happy to be a part of it one of the things i love that you did color tone wise after we saw betty's reveal there this change and we went from these uh, like yellows where it's the su- basically it's sundown you know we, mm-hmm. we see her getting into the evening and and the build to danger again I love right. that. I'm glad that you didn't just start with like uh, lighter shades of red. It was nice because we got to see the mo- from a calm to uh oh. <laughs> yeah, 
yeah. And it was it was a nice. I used the film feel in the beginning, and to me. I love a cinematic comic experience. I love the feeling of motion and movement on, right. on a static page. And then this had so much of that for me. And this is a great example how using these color tones in the right way just built that sense of dread and what was coming next. And I love the convergence then of Betty with Batwoman. She was talking to her sister on the, or cousin, I'm sorry, on the phone mm-hmm. earlier. And this built to her now encountering her in her other role. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I mean, the, the depth after storytelling, you know, that things I think of most. How, how can we, you know, make things pop? How can we take a flat panel and make it look like there's miles of distance? And uh, it's, it's something that, again, I consistently try to do with, with everybody. Just sometimes I pull it off, you know, a little bit better than, uh, than the other times. I love the vulnerability of this sequence, too, because it wraps up with a very vulnerable moment for a hero. She does this to make a difference. She does this enraged against just the world. And, and the violence in the world and what it does to people. And to have this moment of, she took down the villain. So right. this is supposed to be the moment where afterwards the payoff is, not only is Betty safe, but her friend is safe as well. She's accomplished her goal. And to find that somebody's a victim of getting hit by one of the knives, it is this. It is a vulnerable moment. It's a sense of, of failure for her. And how do you deal with that? Because right. it was not, it was something that she was trying to control and now has been taken out of her control again because of this person, a violation again. And the, the power of that moment for me as a, as a, as a cliffhanger on that issue, I just thought it was very well framed. The artwork on this and the story on this one, just, I was, oh, it was, it was very powerful for me. It was one of those when, when you, when you and I were talking about like talking about an issue, I was like, I'm so glad that we can talk about this book because I've loved Detective Comics, and I just thought this was a great example of something where I wanted immediately at when I was done reading, I'm like, they're doing all these original DC animated films, and I know that the next one they're doing is Batman Under the Red Hood. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting here reading this and thinking to myself, boy, would Batwoman make a great animated Oh, yeah, of course. You, you, we know that you know down the line she has to be there. And again, I'm I'm in no position to uh, say what you know happens and and doesn't happen in DC. This is just me talking as a fan. But uh, they they have to make one. It's 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 a strong character, it's strong design. Everything about her, I think, is just pure enjoyment as as a comic book fan. From the fact that she's in the Batman family to just the the style of her costume. You know, when I first saw her costume, I thought it was very close to Batman Beyond. And uh, which I was a huge fan of, so I didn't, I didn't mind it. I enjoyed it, and the more that I see this character, everything about her, she's really owning. I mean, if if you're if you were ever worried about her not really becoming her own character, I mean, she's absolutely solidifying her individual place in this universe. She's definitely a character that if I see anything with her, I'm going to stop and look at it. If it's something I haven't heard of or haven't seen, or a piece of original art. Uh, you know, at a Comic Con with her on there, I'm going to stop and look just just to see what's it about. It's trendy and current, yet there's something classic about it at the same time. Because she feels very fresh. She feels like there's nothing dated about her look. It feels mm-hmm. very much, you know, very contemporary, very edgy. And it, you're right, with like a little bit of a futuristic flair like Batman Beyond, because I get that vibe as well. Yet there is something, and that's a hard balance to find, where you can des- redesign something. Because, you know, she's a character who, obviously, if you look back at the classic Batwoman costume, it looks classic because it was... I I loved the character back in the day. You couldn't do her costume today the way it was, though, because it it would be dated. It would be out of date. To bring her current, and I mean, it's a very different style of a character now, to do that and, and successfully pull that off in a way where not only is the costume catchy, but the whole development of the character is just like, you want to follow her every month. And and I'm glad that she's spinning off in her own series because of this type of thing, because I just, I want to see more. And she's not a character who can be anywhere else but in the spotlight. Yes, I, I, I fully agree. And like I said, if, if you're someone listening who haven't haven't picked up anything Batwoman related, go do it. There's there's really nothing that should that should hold you back. She's a powerful character. I think she's a character that will get your attention almost instantly. And as soon as she has you, you're not gonna you're not gonna put it down. You're gonna follow her. I know that I've definitely become a, a fan of her very quickly. Is there pressure as a Batman fan when you're doing a Batman story versus doing other characters? Because just the way, I, I, I was picking up on your love for Batman, and I'm like, oh, oh boy, we're really connecting on this, because I'm like, he's always been my guy too. 
Is is it harder to do a character that you feel a deeper connection with? 100% yes. Yeah, everything that I have a deep connection with, I'm always a little bit more worried about. I want to. I don't want to make it the same yet. I want it to have that familiar feel to it. I don't want to make it so drastically different that I'm that I lose what I fell in love with when it. You know, I, I think a disappointment comes to mind when I when I finish a page and I go, I, I just don't think it's good enough and I want to rework it or do something else when it comes to characters I love. And, and the, the thing about it is usually your first effort is always the best effort because you care for it so much that you're already putting in your, your, your proper effort. And, and it looks good. And, I mean, thank God for editors on that sense because you send it to them and they, you know, will we'll send it back and they'll let you know if, if something was off. But, uh, no, there's definitely pressure. I wouldn't say it's that intense where we have to, it's not going to make a, a Hollywood drama out of it, but it's definitely, there's definitely that underlining feel of, of pressure just to, as a colorist, I'm adding to a long line of colorists who have worked on Batman before. And then on that note, to a long line of colorists, artists, and writers who've worked on that character before. I mean, when you compare, you know, Jim Lee's art to someone in the past who's done Batman, there's always three different artists that are in in the you know talk of of who's Batman's better and who's Superman's better and and then you go to modern day comics and it, there's always these comparisons and you're always you're always thinking about comparisons where you like this character so much that you hope people will hold your version of Batman whether it's just through colors or through you know the actual art as as a good solid version someone that they will respect and someone that they will uh, know as being a valid version of the character that they love also and i think that's where the pressure comes i think as a whole because i know that everybody has their own favorite character i think i always have that pressure on me but when it comes to batman and having the hundreds and hundreds of storylines that have been told with the character there's always some type of pressure to be original and some type of pressure to, at the same time, make sure that we don't alter the character too much. Is that one of those things, though, as you're working? I, I, I loved when you are saying, like, I, I had to... It's, it's helpful sometimes to have an editor look over it and just kind of validate what you're doing or give you some pointers or tips as far as where you can kind of tweak and things like that. Is that something you do early on in the process, or is it something like if we're hitting into a new scene or a new segment, and you're like... I want to make sure that I'm hitting the mark of what the emotional point is of this particular sequence. Because you oh. really do a drastic amount of uh, variety of Batman stories between confidential... Yeah, I, it's, it's half, half of my stuff, I, I think, is Batman easily. I think what, what I do is, A, I just go for it. They hire me for a reason, and I uh, take confidence in that reason that I'm already working on the story, and I want to give them what I can give them. And then if I feel that... Maybe what I want to give them is redundant, especially inside that issue, or really extreme. I will send a little note to the artist. If I'm friends with them, if I have a good working and open line of communication, I'll, I'll send it to them and say, well, you know, what do you think about that? Usually they like it. Occasionally I'll be like, oh, it's a little too strong, and, and we'll work from there. And, and if I don't have that solid open line of communication uh, with the artist, I'll, I'll go to the editor. Um, again, if it's bold and say, hey, I would like to do this, what do you think? And they'll they'll always say yay or no I'd rather you know you do this and uh, and then I go from there but most of the time I, especially if it's something that I've worked on you know before I mean having a Green Arrow year one under my belt detective I just kind of went for it and I remember uh, getting an email back saying oh I wasn't really expecting this but I love it everybody has a different vision of the book see something in black and white you might think of oh this is going to look like this in color. And then I'll give them something totally different. And I hope that, you know, the, the difference between what they thought it was going to turn out and the way it did turn out is a positive one. And uh, thankfully, more than not, it's been a, a positive turnout. I urge any of the listeners over here to go through some of the Batman Confidential work that you've done. And, and take a look at just the variety of different storytelling and then compare it to this. It's one of the cool things about following your work is just to see when you work with a different art team or a different writer and, and different stories, there's a drastic different presentation of Batman <laughs> throughout your work. Yeah. And I think, that's, I think that's very cool. To me, I, I love that nothing, because to me, that's one of the joys of Batman, is that there's nothing cookie cutter about the mood and tone and the types of stories you can do with Batman. You can pretty much so go anywhere. And yet, it's going to look and feel very different based on location, the intensity of the story. They can be deeply personal stories 
they can be larger scale, intense danger, they can be something where he's kind of more of a superhero in that moment where it's it's all Batman and he owns everything at that moment. Right. And it, different little tweaks and changes are very much going to change the mood and tone and the different art styles throughout it. And that's what's fun about reading comics is that it's there's nothing monotonous about it. Every month, you never know what you're going to get. It's something different, and that's what makes it eye-catching and fun and exciting. That the, How many years I've read comics, I still feel that way, is a testament to it being a true art form. The fact that you still feel every month when you open up the comic box and start paging through your books that there's an excitement to what are they going to hit me with next. And right. this is one of those books that did that for me. And I, I think that's very cool that I can... St- I find that the value of comics that I still get that feeling 30 plus years of reading comics, <laughs> you know, and that's cool. David, one of the things that you've been doing are these contests and you came up with a very cool idea for the next contest. What we're asking listeners to do is call in and do an impersonation of a DC character of your choice. And you can use dialogue from a comic or original dialogue of your own, something to set the mood and the scene of who your character is. I think it's just a very cool idea to see the creativity of our listeners. The deadline of this is going to be March 23rd is the four-year anniversary of our show. What we'd like to do is please call into the show. We're going to take audio clips from that and put it on the website and set up a poll where you guys as listeners get to decide who the grand prize winner is. And the grand prize winner, David, this is your prize. They're going to be getting a prize box. Can you tell them what they're going to get? It's a prize box of DC Comics from you. Correct. It, what it is is my DC comp. We gave away one from the Twitter feed and the, and the blog feed. Thought, you know what? Let's give one away just to podcast listeners, fans of the show, to reward, as, as we call, true fans. It's, it's just a random box full of DC Comics. I think what we're going to do is we're going to give away a new box, this Mark book, and then we're going to give a mystery old box of comics as well. So it'll be two full boxes of comics. Wow. That's a huge prize. So, and then what Jim and I are going to do is for our first and second runners up, I've actually kind of changed this first runner up from our sponsor in You get a trade of your choice from me. So I'm going to donate that. I think that's very cool. And then the second runner-up, we have a grab bag of comics that we've had from listener donations, stuff that Jim and I have put in there. You get to pick from that. So we're going to have three prize winners from this. And I just think it's it's a cool contest. I think the idea is going to be very fun. So I'm looking forward to it. Our show voicemail line, it's 1-440-388-4434. That's 1-440-388-4434. It's in the show notes. You can also do Dr. Norge on Skype which gets you to our voicemail line as well. We're looking for as many entries as we can get. I think it's a fun contest idea. The more entries that we get, the more exciting it gets for everybody. The deadline is March 23rd. All entries have to be in by then. As we get the entries in, we'll start posting them on the website where people can hear them. We'll also air them on the show episodes, so you'll get to hear them on the podcast as well. So I'm excited for this contest idea, and thank you, David, for the very cool contest idea, because I think it's going to be a lot of fun. It, it should be, and I, I really uh, encourage people to go all out, whether it's funny or dramatic. I, I don't know how these will not be funny, uh, at least <laughs> to me, but I, I can't wait, and I, and I hope uh, this way we know that someone who really enjoys comics and uh, the whole fun of the the pretending time of you know really becoming these characters are, are going to uh, come out and show, and uh, I can't wait to see who the winner is. MyZombies.blogspot.com is your blog page. And then Twitter.com forward slash MyZombies is the Twitter feed. Please make sure that you're following both of those if you aren't already. There's links directly in the show notes, also on our website. So if you haven't had a chance to, you don't need to write any of that down, just go to RagingBullets.com, click on it. It takes you right there, and they're easy to follow. And you can also, like I said, click on it right from the show notes as well. So it's very easy to get to David. And David, thank you for your friendship to the show, and and honestly, thank you for your work. (laughs) Detective Comics was awesome this month. Well, thank you so much. You know, as, as always, I'm a, I'm a fan of the podcast, I'm a fan of yours. I really appreciate the enthusiasm you guys put out, and I'm glad you enjoy what I do. And uh, no, this, everything about uh, the show, the contest, uh, the, the Twitter feeds on your part also, you know, it's just, it's everything's a nice, positive community, and the whole goal of just enjoying comic books. I think it's fantastic, and, and again, thank you for having me on the show. Oh, it's a pleasure, and thank you for your time as well. There it is, going into that tunnel. 
want to remind everyone to check out RagingBullets.com where you can find updates on the show. I want to remind everyone to check out our sponsors, DCBService.com, your pre-order discount comic book source. That's DCBService.com. And, of course, InStockTrades.com. They sponsor our Rage of the Months. InStockTrades.com. Remember, orders of $50 or more give you free shipping. So that's a great way. If you're looking for some trades or some hardcovers, things like that, bundle them all together and get that free shipping. That's more savings on already discounted cover prices. Very, very cool. And I want to thank both of those companies for continuing to support us. Our next episode is going to be a Speeding Bullet style show. And we're going to, I'm going to try to be back on this one Sunday night or Monday at the latest. Uh, Monday is going to be the latest cutoff date on this one. This is a little bit of a shorter episode, and I want to thank David Barron for providing this opportunity to put an episode out this week with Jim Sick. This kind of uh, gave us a chance to get you guys some content. I was really excited to have this recording and introduce this great contest. One little shout-out to the contest. Multiple entries are allowed. So if you've got a bunch of ideas... Remember, your, fa- your best one's going to win. So if you're like, hey, ooh, I want to do this character, that character, enter as many times as you like. You're only going to get one prize, obviously. So if you're the grand prize winner, you're going to win that, not the runner-up prizes as well. But, you know, do the multiple entries because, you know, if one doesn't win, maybe the other one will up your chances. And it'll be kind of fun anyway. So if you've got a couple of characters, you're like, ooh, I'd really love to do them, enter 25 times for all I care because it'll be more fun things just to put on the show. So remember that contest. Remember to call our show voicemail line for that. Any questions? about the contest, feel free to email me at ragingbullets at gmail.com. I'd be happy to help you out if you're like, oh, I'm not sure what to do as far as participating in this contest. We'd love to have as many people participate as possible. And, you know, this is meant to be fun. It's all in the spirit of having a good time. So don't worry about how you're going to sound or anything like that. You know, it's celebrate with us. This is four years of Raging Bullets. It's a great contest. We want you guys to have a part in this particular contest. I think it's a fun contest. So don't be afraid to really get into the spirit of of just enjoying comics. And uh, one more thing about RagingBullets.com, I want to shout out Life in the Gutter and the Bad Case Book, two brand new entries up for them. We also are linked to a bunch of blogs. There's old content from the old website. I'm constantly updating. I'm trying to bring over some of our old material, updating new material with news that I've been spotting around the web from the DC Universe with some commentary on that as well. So hopefully you guys are enjoying the new website and uh, some of the content that's been up there. Our forum is back in business. We also, and I'm going to keep it up and running, the Facebook group that's been up there. So uh, feel free to participate in any of those areas. And lots of conventions going on. Make sure to visit David over at the Emerald City Comic Con if you're going to be there. We've got the CGS Super Show coming up. We're going to be at C2E2. And we're also going to be considering going to that Summit City Comic Con, which is uh, one that's coming up. It's a brand new convention put on by our friends over at DCB Service and InStockTrades.com. All those things are in our show links. And we'll see you, like I said, by Monday at the latest with a brand new Speeding Bullet style show. The books that came out this week just beg to be talked about. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on at the moment in D.C. that, uh, oof, I don't know how we're going to fit it in one show. So lots of stuff to discuss, and we will see you in a few days. Bye. Bye.